report back session. We, we'll try to push through this quickly so people can have dinner. Um, Partha, you want? Uh, Ong Yang, you, who, who's, who's reporting back? You are, right? So um, as we hear what happened in the breakout session, we'll just absorb it. There will be no discussion. Yeah? We need to save time, so we'll just absorb what you have to say and uh, bring up discussions later, not, not in this meeting. Okay. Yeah, just report. Yes. Actually, uh, our uh, Asian Cancer Plus breakout session is reported by um, Tini. So she will prepare that something for the presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this session, uh, we are going to have a quick, quick, quick report back for infectious disease. Uh, we have two slides for Q&A summary type. Maybe we can show the slide later for this detail. So maybe you're going to quick summary. So short time. First, we discussed uh, which disease is the target disease of our cohort. So we con make conclusion. We need a general network applicable range of infectious disease, not only single disease, but much range ran of diseases, and also outbreak of the pandemic. So, but we focus on three major targets, tuberculosis, NTM, and dengue. But anyway, we can have a shared consortium to coordinate the applied disease. And tissue, maybe blood and nasal swab is fine, but because we are focusing genomics, human genetics is also fine. And select a technical method. Actually, because we need a co international collaboration, we need to share the, uh, First, not sharing the biospecimens, but sharing the data. So data sharing is much faster than uh, and shareable. It communicates the internet collaboration. And there is really, because we need to collaborate with many range of the uh, countries, we, we mainly focus on basic, more basic and cheaper technology. I think this is different from cancer groups, but maybe single RNA sequence is the basic technology, but we, of course, the institute, if we can do more, we can add, add advanced technologies. So anyway, uh, also we need to care the institute's country where CRNC is not feasible. This is on a discussion point. And fourth, okay, uh, we also need to strain level diversity of target infectious disease. So each infectious disease, we definitely need the detailed cr criteria and definition of who to include, which pathology is important. So we need to separate definition of the uh, infectious pathology in each of the diseases. And also, uh, anyway, first pathology analysis is really interesting. So uh, we basically focusing on single RNA sequence case control analysis, but need to define uh, more unified protocol rates, the biological aspects of the infectious disease, and some preparation and determine sometimes much more stimulation styles. And of course, grant proposal, yes, we definitely need, but if it's stronger stick keep granting, then nothing starts. So actually, we can start what we can do, and also in parallel, we're looking for the grants. And also, what is important is we need to make a unified RRB connecting protein issues across Asia. So this is truly important if you want to make a, a scheme which can quickly assess the newly emerging infectious disease. So, the goal of our consortium is to make this kind of global network. And also maybe going to follow Asia policy and data and projects uh, sharing. So this is a kind of the quick uh, uh, summary of the discussion yesterday. But we will keep discussion and also want to have an announcement recruitment with the participant institute, a country, and researchers, and so on. OK, uh, this is the result. Uh, may I request all of the presenters to present this, uh, to uh, forward these slides by email to Dr. John Randall. Uh, we can then take it up in the organizing committee. Sorry for the delay. Okay. So uh, this is a breakout report back of the ACCA uh, projects. And as we discussed yesterday, the cancer type of interest is lung, liver, and colon cancers. And the, technique proposed, the proposed technique that we will use is spatial transcriptomics, uh, sample type of interest, uh, just for the sake of um, actually more like international shipping with the FFPET. And uh, to focus on colon cancer projects, the question that we want to answer would be uh, the Asian tumor immune diversity, pan-Asian genetic diversity, and also focusing on treatment response. Uh, platforms right now it would be Cineums, uh, 500 gene panels, and the total number of samples would be around 100. 
inclusion criteria, which is actually is not uh, fixed as yet, uh, we would like to focus on uh, stage three MSS uh, that has adjuvant treatment plus minus IO. So the sample uh, acquisitions. So here, the specific inclusion criteria for sample and detailed experiment design is uh, has to be determined, and then we need to form a standard CIF to collect the clinical data from uh, the, the specimen that was sent, and this would include molecular testing result and demographics and risk factors. Uh, we will have to develop central IRB protocols, uh, MTA and DSA, so that this would be standardized uh, according to the, the countries that, that join, and also depending on the, the policy uh, for each country. I'm not sure that you can actually ship FFPE tissue out uh, of the country or not, but I think this has to be explored. And also, yesterday we have some very uh, like important point from, from uh, all the experts in the audience, which is the potential issues when comparing pan-Asian tumor samples. Uh, it might cause some bias from uh, country-specific or batch effect from uh, different FFPET pre-analytical factors, which, I mean, even within the same countries, we would have this anyway between hospitals. Um, so what we can think of right now would be the inclusion of reference samples uh, that, that can be used more like as a control for this. And then uh, comparing Asian results with uh, Caucasians might also help. So the next step, uh, starting from next year, would be very early pilot uh, phase one from the three cancer types that, that we just discussed, 100 samples each. Uh, we welcome samples from each country and would be great that we can, if we can form a collaborative network on this. Uh, the first output would be a joint publication, and if each country can apply local funding, uh, that would actually help drive this into a bigger scale. Uh, the, the data sharing platform for phase one um, can be HCA portal or something else. Um, and also, if we compare between different types of cancers, that might help reduce the batch effect, but this has to be uh, seen. Uh, phase two, which, which would be after all this is done, applying for a big uh, like pharma or international funding agencies would be what we want to do together. Uh, adding more research questions that you asked yesterday would be nice. Uh, maybe more cancer types or other multi-omics analysis, um, any omics data set that would help answering the questions. And also, if it has to be, I mean, if the spatial data has to be done um, by each country on site, we can actually share the protocol and maybe share uh, the data generated from each country as well. So how to get involved? Um, the first thing with that for the colon cancer project that uh, Mung Yang is here, so we need to form a central IRB protocols and then also sample prep SOP sharing. Uh, that would be the next thing that we will be done. And then for each country that want to be involved, local IRB applications, MTA and DSA, has to be figured out based on your uh, institute requirement. And also, I think contact person from each country that would be um, the main point of, of contact for us. And right now, um, maximum, maximum of samples uh, from each country would be around 10. And if you are interested, this is uh, Wong Yang's email. And we have two more main PI uh, anchors, who is based in Australia right now, would be focusing on liver cancers. And Dr. Suzuki um, at U of Tokyo in Japan, focusing on lung cancer. So. This is uh, what we summarized from yesterday. Okay, that's it. Uh, please email these slides to Dr. Randall. I know everyone is tired, so wrapping up quickly. Yesterday we had a breakout session on uh, uh, understanding the microbiome diversity across human population and how we are trying to build an atlas um, understanding that. And uh, the topics that we discussed were basically um, how we can focus on global collaborations and for that we have to understand what are the challenges and what are the problems globally people are facing and where we uh, need to focus on. So we had a lot of participation from different parts of India and from other places as well. 
and um, we basically discussed about uh, how we can understand microbiome and child health and women health and also understanding the microbiome and antibiotic re resistance population um, uh, uh, under infectious conditions and I think there was a big um, um, uh, issue about low biomass microbiome and a lot of people pitched in into that and uh, I think there were people joining from um, from the viral immu immunology expertise as well and it was a good to see the integration of the bacterial microbiome and then viral microbiome and how we can pitch that in together and uh, we also discussed about how we can standardize data collection aspects uh, in in um, uh, in our pipelines and how we can uh, make it more cost effective we also touched upon that little bit and uh, uh, how to statistically uh, make uh, significance out of our data and the analysis part which there were quite a few people uh, expert in that area um, which Shovik also wrote in and um, it, it was a good discussion upon using the technologies that other people are using and also the analysis approaches they are using and different sample types of course the majority were using gut microbiome biomes so or gut uh, fecal samples but there were other type of tissues that people were interested in so that part was also touched upon and the midterm goal of this whole um, uh, flagship project is to understand the microbiome not just alone in silo like we have been doing since uh, ages but also to build bring in the immune aspect into that and the, the human aspect into that and study in totality what's happening um, in that space and uh, there was a lot of focus on cancer microbiome and how it can impact the disease progression um, and um, also how we can create synergy across diseases and understand what we know from our, our uh, experiments. I'll um, give the mic to my colleague Shovek now. We'll yeah, so in this uh, breakout session, we primarily focused on the fact that as we know now that the number of microbial cells in our human body outnumber our human cells by the ratio 50%, more than 50%. And the HCA phase 2, we would like that uh, the HCA phase 2 should consider including the single cell sequencing for this bi human microbiome to understand the host and microbiome interactions on various organs and uh, a road map should be created. So what we, we, we discussed in this breakout session and th this was a conglomerate of offline and online participants also. Online participants from different parts of India and also from Switzerland in, in midnight. They were also online and everybody was very enthusiastic. We found in the offline participants several cancer scientists com coming there. So the main point that we started with was is microbiome effect or a cause? This is something that we are very intrigued upon. Is it an effect or a cause? Is it just an association or not? So there were experts who, who told that there are studies that have shown that the sequencing studies have to be coupled with in vitro mechanistic and in vivo animal model studies now. That will give us a, a you know, opinion that is it an effect or a cause. Secondly, uh, since many cancer scientists were there, they put up this point that this human microbiome, is there any role of the human microbiome in the cancer thing? So the, there are studies that have been done, tissue resident microbiome studies have identified specific mi microbiome associated with cancer and with the stages al al also from T1 to T2 to T3 to T4. But these are now mere association studies. Lots of such studies are being done, but we need to also figure out is it an effect or cause that the same thing now there are people who ask this question that in the in the wound healing acute wounds and other kinds of wounds that don't heal do they have any specific microbiome signature well there are studies that are happening and antimicrobial resistance in the human microbiome needs to be studied for that Low biomass, as Archita has mentioned, we studied, we actually discussed a lot about these challenges faced in the low biomass samples, like skin microbiome, vaginal swabs microbiome, like eyes, from the eyes that they, they do the microbiome, how do they do this? So what we have seen, and personally our lab also works on skin, so what we have seen that we could do 16 is for sure, but while we go to more deeper studies like shotgun and metatranscriptomics, it's really a challenge, because the, the, skin swabs don't have so much of microbiome DNA. 
then lastly uh, they, we had this thing that how to translate the microbiome findings for the development of biotherapeutics now fecal transplant has hold a lot of promise but fecal tra transplant is not allowed in many countries so we can use these uh, organoid models and we can use fermented foods are being used as pro probiotics in some aboriginal populations so using of the microbiome and the me metabolome together can hold a promise for the development of the biotherapeutics so we would li like to uh, you know uh, re request the hca to think about uh, the single cell microbiome sequencing in un unison with these uh, human cell atlas so 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 that uh, you know we can study the host microbiome interactions beyond the association level thank you Uh, Archita Shovik, don't forget to send these slides to Dr. Randall. All right, and I guess uh, that's the end of the report back, and now we're moving to the panel discussion. I'd like to get all the panel members on the stage. Okay, uh, hello, uh, hello everyone joining, keep joining the session. Uh, oh. We are going to start the uh, panel discussion, the last event of this. So I would like to first ask the uh, panel discussion coming in front, front of the, uh, yes, I think we have five, one, two, three, four, five panelists. Yep. So the panelist is Akir, Jay, Avis, Natini, Grace. Okay. Uh, Let's start the panel discussion. First of all, I have an announcement. Because we have so much excited discussions, we do not have so much time, so we need to shorten the uh, panel discussion into 30 minutes. So we ask each panelist to briefly explain your opinion with around 50 to 60% of the time which you want to uh, talk the best. OK. Uh, OK, let's first, I would like to uh, ask, each, uh, ask each of the panelists, introducing, uh, including the introduction. So the brief overview of the question, for, and then going to the uh, details uh, talk. So my first uh, question for the all the panelists is maybe a global or general expression of the this uh, meeting. So uh, what what actually you guys learned the best from this uh, meeting, or what you have learned so much best from the single cell uh, analysis? So I would like to ask you what you lessons you learned for, for each expert in this panel, especially putting weights on why single cell is important. So, Jay, please go ahead first, your uh, answers. Um, yeah, thank you, Uti. My name is Jay Shin. I'm a PI at Genomic Institute of Singapore. Um, why single cells? I think this is a question that doesn't really need to be emphasized, but I think overall, um, power of single cell is to reveal heterogeneity of our, our body, our complex system. And if, uh, definitely it provides a higher uh, granularity to dissect the cellular composition at, at the molecular level. And this high dimensional space that we are all uh, exploring definitely is high valuable. And the reason uh, or the benefit of profiling this high granularity and high dimensional space is actually um, cost effectiveness. Uh, you know, we don't really think about, we, we, we do expect that sequencing is expensive, and I think there's no doubt about that. But the amount of data that are, we're able to extrapolate and understand uh, is, is far more cost effective than any other approaches that are out there. Um, so, you know, there are some calculations where if you do bulk uh, of RNA sequencing where you have one sample and you do sequence very deep uh, versus, you know, say 10 different cell types that you find in the blood, uh, you automatically reduce the cost by one-tenth, uh, but you can further multiplex to multiple donors, uh, say eight donors, then you further cut the cost uh, to, you know, one-eighth. And so you, it really ex exponentially cost-effective strategy to multiplex and to reveal heterogeneity. And I think there's, we should always <laughs> you should do single, uh, single cell and not even consider bulk going forward. 
my okay. opinion. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And I fully agree. Cost effects matrix. This is really help uh, help us to expand the possibility of the main samples. Thank you. Okay, great game. Next. Thanks, Yuki. Uh, my name is Archita, and I had a lab in Telethon Kids Institute in Perth, uh, Western Australia. And uh, my journey with single cell uh, actually started because I was studying the microbiome and how the bacteria interact with immune cells. And it so happens that you have so many different types of microbes in your, in your body. And the way they interact with your immune cells is quite unique. There are very specialized immune cells, and they are very low in number. It's very hard to even capture them using uh, techniques like flow cytometry sometimes, depending upon how much samples you have. So that's where I thought, let's dive into this um, aspect of looking at one cell at a time, and, um, but also for diseases. I think if we really want to look at the cellular heterogeneity, it's a great way of doing it. But also the cell-cell uh, interactions, because there could be two different cell types which are quite similar in nature, but they are not making similar kind of interactions. And these kind of information have been revealed using single-cell RNA sequencing and the tools that are being developed now um, by, like, in silico, you can look at the cellular interactions. And something similar we were discussing earlier, that now with spatial uh, transcriptomics coming into picture, so we started with single cell and we started with studying one cell at a time, but now is the time to actually put those cells into their spatial context and look spatially how these cells are interacting with each other because there is a lot of heterogeneity that doesn't come from single cell aspect but eventually comes from where these cells are positioned. So that's where we are also moving now uh, as, a, as a community. And um, yeah, it's a fascinating time, and I think we are open for more questions because people who have not tried that yet might be really interested in knowing how they can try it in the future. Thank you. So I'm uh, Obhijit Choudhury. I am a clinical hepatologist. I work, for, uh, I work at the Indian Institute of Liver and Digestive Sciences. So uh, the uh, meeting over the last two days had really been very exciting for me. I really don't understand much of the nuances of, uh, of uh, single cell uh, genomics, but what I know is, and we know, you know, we clinicians are very opportunistic. We look forward to the basic scientists to deliver us the tools that help us improve our outcomes of uh, therapy and assessment of patients. So as I understand, and as we took off precision, more precision and more ability to predict diseases, we look forward to you know, single cell uh, studies over the next couple of years to give us uh, more information that can help improve patient outcomes. Particularly when I talk and I work for, with people inflicted with liver disease, and we keep on talking this with our uh, uh, chief scientist in, uh, at John C. Martin Center, which is uh, uh, the research center that I work with Professor Partho Mujumdar. We had been discussing that liver, which I work with, is the, is the, is the, you know, the model organ, which is a place where single cell have got a very important role to play. And I think Ram Dash Gupta is working greatly on uh, liver cell genomics and many other people. Because nothing in liver happens with and which is done by a single cell. You have got and you cannot judge liver diseases based on anything. Any of the liver does not have an endoscopy. You know, in intestine have got an endoscopy. Stomach has got an endoscopy. But in order to liver dis understand liver disease, you have to look for understanding, uh, try to understand the biology of liver disorders based on complex interactions and I think time has now come based on single cell techniques that can really lead us a lot in improving our understanding of liver disorders particularly and many other disorders. People are working a lot on cancer but I think non-cancer chronic disorders present before us a tremendous opportunity for improving our understanding particularly in development of biomarkers and therapeutics uh, not only in liver disorders, in others. So, as a clinician, I feel excited when basic scientists keep on discussing this in front of us and we look forward to a time. And that's how single cell genomics look forward to me. Not only genomics, all the omics 
uh, that are going to unravel and that are going to follow from genomics. So that's my perception and that's my beginning. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Grace. I'm a GIS fellow at the Genome Institute of Singapore. I am a computational biologist by training. Um, I think, so this is my first human cell atlas meeting um, and the whole thing has been really exciting. I think one of the really, really cool things that I know I've, learned, I've seen in the past two days is like how much you can do with single cell RNA sequencing. Like you might think you can, you know, just get transcriptal information, but it turns out that, you know, by designing experiments in a certain way or by looking at it uh, slightly differently, for example, a uh, single cell EQTL um, analysis, you actually get a lot out of, you know, single cell sequence, single cell RNA sequencing. And I think that, you know, um, because I study colon cancer and we kind of come from, before that, we had bulk sequencing, right? So, you know, moving paradigms towards the single cell RNA sequencing, it's sort of like, I feel like now we've come to the point where we can use single cell RNA sequencing to describe all like the components, um, but we still don't really understand how all the components come together to actually, um, uh, for the whole system to work. Um, and I think that, you know, um, over the past few days, like we've been trying to move towards that, both by describing heterogeneity, um, across ancestries, across within a person, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natini Jinawat. I'm from Thailand. Uh, more like, this is very new to me. So I'm a molecular pathologist, and uh, I'm more like a user. Quite naive in all the things that we have been talking about for the last two, two days. Uh, but anyway, I mean, for me, a single cell RNA seq um, is quite a revolution, like my PhD actually is on uh, gastric cancers, and I spent one and a half years just sitting in front of the computers, cutting the cells, cancer cells one by one out from uh, the LCM, like the circumcision microscope, and that is very painful. So this is like, you know, I think it will help a lot of PhD student life <laughs> right now. <laughs> you don't have to do the same thing like what I did for like almost mm -hmm. two years. Um, but anyway, um, because we do a lot of cancer biomarkers in, in the lab and with the new technology right, right now, I think we are at the forefront of uh, being able to identify some more accurate biomarkers for drug response for cancers. And uh, also, I guess when, when everything becomes more stable and cheaper, hopefully it can be very be used in a clinical lab. And that's what I have hope for. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. We already have so much nice <laughs> summary of that. Yes, my quick update for the lesson from this meeting. Yes, uh, just simple. So me meeting in person is much better than meeting online. Okay, uh, let's go to that because we have already, we have so many discussion points. But maybe I'm going to pick some of this. Okay, uh, Jay, I am would like to ask you some of the first question. So uh, we have made so many collaboration and through this human atlas, but how do you think how past or ongoing project collaboration have been worked out? What are the tips to be succeeding to make this network? And especially how we initiate the effort in initiating such consortium efforts? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, I've been very fortunate to be part of a few consortiums, including Phantom, as well as the Human Cell Atlas and IDA and so on. But, um, I think there are three fundamental pillars that needs to uh, come to existence. One is samples. Mm -hmm. So obviously, right now we are moving more to human samples, and ability to acquire uh, patient-derived and clinical samples are extremely important. Uh, so having that access and ability to uh, acquire them in an ethical and appropriate manner is extremely important. And the second pillar is the technology. So we've been talking a lot about single cell TEDx or perhaps other platforms, including special uh, strategies. So you have to have the robust platform or technology that can obviously uh, uh, good operators and teams that can manage that. The third and most importantly, of course, uh, computational and, and, and bioinformatics and analysis. Um, and it's rare that one lab can do all three, and maybe one or two. Uh, so the calls for naturally you need to collaborate. And you need to find and seek people with different expertise and have those people come together. I would say if you have samples, 
technology and analysis, you can write a paper, right? But that alone uh, it, it is not also the ultimate goal of Human Cell Atlas. And really the idea is what can we create that will generally help the broader community? I think the, F, the, the mission of a consortium is to provide valuable reference or a community-driven consensus uh, to tell the international scientific community what could be the international standards for, uh, for genome annotation or for cancer atlas or human cell atlas. And that it is not one individual lab or not individual institution or country saying this is what we believe is to be true. The consortium is to create a community consensus saying the international the collective members believe that this is what, you know, to our best of our ability, what the international, uh, the reference should be. Uh, so that gaining that kind of trust and ability to uh, attract many users and community to leverage on this resource is also a key component to um, collaboration. So yes, uh, it's important to develop your local consortium, uh, local network of clinicians and technologists and computational to write papers, but please do consider how you can work at regional level mm. or even at the international level to create greater value that can bring in uh, users and attract people to really leverage the resource that you've created uh, in order that uh, you could really help many other people and scientists around the world. So uh, be flexible and horizontally and reaching out collaboration, but also please consider how you can impact the international community by contributing to the international consortiums like the Human Cell Atlas. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. I, I fully agree. Such much more factors are very important. And also people who make leadership is also important. I think you have been nice leadership from the past several years with this meeting. We, we hope to find more. <laughs> yeah, we need definitely. more leaders. And yes. I think you know, many of you are in this room. Uh, to take mm -hmm. initiatives uh, such as flagship projects mm -hmm. uh, and there are so many potentials to create new science and new collaboration so go for it and you know talk to people and, uh, and we can help to facilitate and talk connect you to the right people but we need new leaders and I think there are definitely many of you here in this room yes. great great uh, thank you. okay maybe going to the next points okay I hope you so okay maybe uh, so, because single cell is really a fantastic world, everyone actually wants to be involved. But the jump starts, so when to start, or how to start this technology is also a challenge, especially for young PIs. So, uh, okay, uh, here's, uh, here, so how do you think, how is the tips or best practice for the jump start research into single cell area, including your own, uh, your own experience? Um, thanks, Yuki. So yeah, I think um, I'm uh, here um, uh, very new to this, and uh, but yet have some experience. So I can talk about like when you're starting an, um, a project or an experiment pertaining to a single cell or spatial anything, the first and the most important thing is to talk to someone who has done it before and talk to someone who has done the exactly same thing, the same kind of question that you are asking who has done that before and then start with anything else, sample collection, uh, ordering or even talking to the vendors. Before everything else, talk to someone who has done that. And I can tell you that from uh, some uh, very personal examples that um, if you are, like, in the starting, we used to jump into the field of single-cell RNA sequencing. And if you're an immunolog uh, immunologist and if you're interested in immune cells, you would go towards five prime sequencing and you would like to do TCR sequencing to understand T cells if you are interested in T cells or BCR if you are interested in B cells. So we also jumped into that. But then we realized one very important thing that you can do TCR sequencing, but if you really want to understand the heterogeneity of your entire TCR um, uh, repertoire, you have to actually look at both TCR alpha, beta and gamma delta. And for alpha, beta, you can do that straight away, but for gamma delta, you just have to add two extra primers. It was as simple as that. But we would not know 
unless we have actually talked to someone who has been doing this for quite some time. So that's the most important thing as a newcomer. Talk, 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 talk as much as you can, then only design your experiment. The second thing is, um, zeroing down to which technology you're going to use. And I think that's where a lot of people have confusion and a lot of um, influences come from where you are, what exactly is present in your institution. So look for that because single cell, spatial, they all require a lot of infrastructure. And you will have to see what is present at closest to your disposal. So that can help you decide what you want to do. But also a mix of your question because you can't just do what's present there. Now there are so many service providers which can actually help you no matter where you are sitting in the world but you need to know what exactly you are looking for the third thing is which I think was very important for me before you jump into any sort of omics realize the importance of bioinformatics and don't just assume that you will do the experiment and then eventually you will understand something out of it because the question is in your head so even if you find someone who can do it for you quickly cheaper or any way possible they are not going to possibly answer the same questions that you are looking for or even get you closer to that so realize and embrace the power of bioinformatics and see that factor that into your whole setup that you are going to analyze your data or you're going to uh, at least have a good collaborator who's going to do it with you with the right question in their mind um, and um, yeah so i think these are the steps which to start with something to look for thank you yeah. your comments may be very helpful for that especially for the young investigators thank you okay the next point shows uh i visit so okay this is related to your previous comments. So, we, we, we have, there are so many single cell technology and researches, but how should we connect this technology research into clinical applications? So, how do you think the translational way we should proceed? Yes, so that's going to be the final uh, expectation from the technology that is evolving, I believe. Uh, I, I just was uh, wondering that, you know, whenever a new technology enters into a scientific uh, field, and, and I, I would consider single cell uh, sequencing as a fairly new technology, there is significant amount of enthusiasm and everybody starts feeling whenever he or she does the work that mine is the most clinically relevant one. And, and is, it, that's good for enthusiasm, but let's remember that not all the work that we do will be clinically translatable. We often are so enthusiastic and start feeling that, hey, what the data that I have got has got all clinical relevance. But, you know, we all know that of 100 works, maybe one will have clinical relevance. We need to understand that and not getting depressed. And I believe clinical relevance does not come straight away from a study which somebody starts keeping that mine has to have a clinical relevance. Like you carry out your work and that might at some point, like say I am a hepatologist and as I see over the last decade or so, the, the, the most interesting genomics data that has improved our understanding is identification of PNPLA3 genes. Okay, but that dis did not start off when Helen Hobbs lab started telling that we are targeting this gene. So what I feel is you start doing your work in your own way and start thinking that mine is addressing a question, but that's not going to go to bedside tomorrow itself, which is probably premature to conceive of at the beginning of your study. And I think there are two very important areas where single cell sequencing and genomics and other omics data can contribute. One is predictive biomarker development, which should be our initial goal. Why I'm telling this? The usual jump start is I will develop a, I will do some research which leads to therapy target defined definition. Let me tell you that defining therapy targets is not a very easy job. You know, many therapy targets are targeted and pharmaceutical industry keeps on looking for that. But most of these fall short in the usual way. So let's conceive of a scenario where in the next couple of years, we will have fair amount of data to suggest that predictive biomarkers in cancer, already we are nearing to that 
but particularly in the set of chronic disorders. Again, I'm telling, I work with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is called as Massel, and it's, it's the classical disorder where you don't have a single pathway acting. And this is where the role of single cell genomics probably, it's so cell-to-cell -cell interaction, working over the temporal frame, not working on the cross-section, how the, uh, you know, the biological phenomena are interacting and producing a clinical event, in the, in, the, in the set of events is all that unravel. So I would conceive of that biomarker development should be our initial target. And we need to define our phenotypes very well while doing that. Unless we do that, unless we define our phenotypes of our work, we are not going to succeed. So that's what okay. the way I think. Okay. Uh, great passion, Evis. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, the next question, a little bit more broader things. How to make global initiative with single cell data? So this is for Grace. So especially if we get some new revolutionized technology, something special, economic, so how you should adapt such revolutionized technology and go into medicine, and how should we make a global initiative? Sorry for the broad question, but yeah, how do you think on it? I think, um, you know, one of the really um, nice things that have come out of the human cell atlas are these computational tools and pipelines that have become more and more accessible to biologists. And I think that's very important because, you know, sometimes um, as a computational biologist who works in between, it's kind of almost mm, sometimes easier to hand the computational tools to the biologist than from the biologist to actually, like, um, distill the knowledge um, inside their heads or for example for a pathologist to tell to somehow be able to explain you know what they're looking at in the image why they're looking at it and then take that and move that into computational um, thing I think those are both works in progress but by developing tools that are able to integrate I think you know these skills and then making them accessible to people then you know more and more people around the world can actually like take these data sets and then apply their own unique knowledge to them and you know through the development of you know human in the loop um, 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 software um, then th then these then this allows more and more people to participate um, in initiatives like the human cell atlas Thank you. Great. Yeah, I fully agree. And it should maybe be a good uh, opportunity to foster such initiatives. Okay, the next question is, okay, uh, more funding issues. So this is for uh, Nadine. Yes, of course, uh, what's the best practice or strategy to seeking funding for single cell organics? How to align and engage with industry? Of course, yeah, uh, we are very strongly supported by Chen Zuckerberg. I hope it should be keep, but we also need to find a much more way, especially collaboration with industry. So how do you think what is the best way to... To get the funding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's like quite a question for me. <laughs> okay. So uh, again, um, as a pathologist. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so uh, I think for me, uh, first thing that you do when you want to, to do single sales experiment, um, I think even before having funding is to find someone who knows how to do it. <laughs> and in this case, um, we need to reach out to collaborators who actually maybe has uh, expertise in this field before you, and maybe, um, again, maybe know other people that can be a hub for you mm -hmm. to, to, to apply for the funding. And I guess it may be the same for every country, um, those kind of hubs. <laughs> Um, for the pharma companies, uh, again, right now what they are interested in would be to, like, like Dr. Apichit said, so identifying biomarkers for the existing um, targeted therapies. And as we all know, uh, IEO is very big in cancer right now, and the response rate of, of uh, treatment for IEO is like only 10%, even now. But when the patients can be, you know, can, if they can respond well, you can almost kill them. So that's, that's the idea. So uh, I think if you are working on drug response or, or something that can be linked to, I think the fastest way is that you can work on something that can be linked to some targeted therapies that may be a way for you to approach uh, the farmers and, and might be able to um, get some funding from them. But I think first of all, you need to find someone who um, can become a hub for you to build on. Yeah. Okay, this is yeah. like as a perfect. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead, Jack. Okay. 
I think the uh, other, other opportunity, maybe not with industry, is there are a lot of national genome projects that happens in many countries. And obviously, there's a lot of funding that goes into doing whole genome sequencing across the population. I think we could really build a case as to why not single cell RNA sequencing of PBMCs, at least, uh, along with the whole genome sequencing project. I think the reason for that is, uh, obviously, immune cells and RNA-seq are much more dynamic, and there are changes that occur through the age and environment, and whereas the whole genome sequencing is just static measurement of uh, one time point. Uh, and I think there are also arguments that even whole genome sequencing, that our DNA can uh, acquire somatic mutations over a lifetime. So I think if, you, if as a community you can come together and build a strong case that why not do whole genome plus RNA sequencing and leverage on the already existing programs, I think that could create funding opportunities uh, with many countries that have whole genome projects. Thank you. Yeah, actually also there are so many professionals of the funding this field, so maybe we can help each other. So, okay, we have several minutes left, so I think the panel discussion should be interactive between audience and parents. So is there anyone who want to put a question to the professional panelists here? Is there anyone who want to raise your hand to questions? No questions, right? Okay, like maybe. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think it's a wonderful discussion, and uh, really thank. Uh, I mean, I would like to thank all of you for you know, for, for, for for the fantastic uh, for the fantastic job. I don't think I have a question after so many hours, uh, and I think that everyone will probably conclude. Uh, and uh, but uh, yeah, uh, probably. Should celebrate this meeting, I guess, and, and, and be happy for what we have achieved so far, I think. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, Piero, for providing us a nice closing remark. So, yes, now it's weird on the time, so we are oh, <laughs> very happy to cross the panel discussion, and also this is the last program of this meeting, so thank you for everyone. Keep joining the two days for a long but really exciting and passionate meeting. And we're really happy to have you guys in here. Thank you. Well, good evening. Everything good that starts must come to an end. Uh, before I actually project some slides, I have a request to all of you. Please do not go away without having dinner. Yeah, please do not go away without having dinner. Let's dine together because, you know, today is the last day of HCA Asia. Um, so I do have some slides and, uh, yes, so uh, those are the closing slides. Uh, first of all, again, one more appeal. Uh, do become a member of the HCA. Get yourself as a member of one of the working, uh, one of the, um, you know, bio, bio networks, and that way you become a member of uh, the Human Cell Atlas. So I um, also tag us on social media, and you can actually go forward and do that. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, the hotel, Taj City Center, in particular, uh, Mr. Tonumoy Basu. I don't know if he is here. He's uh, constantly uh, been engaged with us, and he's helped us a lot. I also take this opportunity to thank. Uh, you know, the AV team who have uh, worked very much with us and the uh, decorators who have put up the platforms, etc. Um, of course, the Human Cell Atlas Asia is very grateful to Liver Foundation for hosting us here in the city of Calcutta. And uh, so far as I'm concerned, I would like to express my personal uh, indebtedness to HCA Asia for bringing HCA Asia 2023 to the city of Kolkata. Uh, thank you very much, HCA Asia and uh, HCA. Um, the, uh, the, thank you, thank you. Um, we don't have counts of how many people attended because there's been a, a floating, a little bit of a floating uh, 
crowd. Uh, virtual attendees, yeah, they came in and out, so we really don't have counts of those. But uh, the, in the two days, we have had representations from 34 countries. We had 36 posters, um, and we had 45 speakers and panelists. A total of 48 talks, three of them were, um, you know, um, virtual talks, or some of them were virtual talks, and we had three breakout sessions. So thank you, thank you very much, and uh, indeed thank you for a great meeting to all the speakers, chairpersons, panelists, um, and, and people who actually attended the breakout sessions. Thank you very much. Uh, we really would like to hear from you. Um, what were the shortcomings? How would you like us to improve? And uh, there is a five-minute survey that you can, uh, we would like you to take, and that's the QR code. So um, do, do help us improve ourselves uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, the recordings of this entire session are available, so they, they are available um, in this uh, particular website. So if you go to the website of the Human Cell Atlas uh, 2023, Asia 2023, you will get these recordings. And uh, uh, some special thanks. Uh, special thanks go to uh, general operational support from the Chan, uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Klarman Family Foundation, and the uh, Wellcome Trust. Um, again, like I said, Liver Foundation has been a gracious host, and we are very grateful to uh, Liver Foundation. Uh, the program committee worked very hard to put up this program, and uh, these are the faces in the program committee. Uh, most, most of the people, most of those of us who are on the program committee, most of us gave talks, so uh, you, you know them. But again, on behalf of HCA Asia 2023, I uh, really thank the uh, program committee for putting up uh, such a beautiful uh, and academically rich program. Uh, the local planning committee also worked hard with respect to the logistics, etc. And uh, we thank the local uh, organizing committee for doing this. Um, the, uh, I've already thanked the speakers, session chairs, panelists, uh, people who conducted breakout sessions and so on. I'm not going to read all of the names, but uh, you know, they, the, the, they are all important. And I'll um, you know, thank everybody for um, for doing this to, uh, on behalf of HCA Asia 2023. Um, there are people who, young people took notes and young people ran around with microphones. Um, so uh, really they, they, they are the backbone of this particular meeting and uh, we do have to summarize uh, what we have learned from this meeting and we will learn all of that from the notes that they have taken. and. Uh, the mic runners uh, went to you with their microphones and therefore you wouldn't have gotten a chance to speak if, uh, or we wouldn't have gotten a chance to hear you speak unless uh, they brought the microphones to you. So we thank all of the, scri all of the poster presentations, presenters, scribes and volunteers, um, the uh, audio, audio video um, IT team, the Liver Foundation uh, and the HCA. Um, executive office. I uh, really wish to also thank two, two people whose names appeared, but I personally would like to thank Dr. Partha Mukherjee and Dr. Deepesh Das. Uh, I hope they're in the hall. Uh, without their help, I could never have done this. Uh, amazing people. I mean, they kept awake the whole night and, uh, you know, organized this hall and so on and so forth. So um, it's amazing that they have uh, the kind of logistical support that they have provided to HCA Asia 2023, um, Dr. Partha Mukherjee and Dr. Deepesh Das. Uh, both, both belong to the Liver Foundation, our host, but still they went out of their way. I also take this opportunity to thank all of you for participating in HCA Asia 2023. Without your participation, only a few of us gave talks, right? Most of you have heard, and your participation was absolutely critical. Otherwise, we would not even be able to hold this meeting, and the meeting would, be, uh, would, would just be wasted, essentially. So thank you very much for uh, attending, for participating in this meeting. And uh, again, like I said, please do not go back without having dinner with us tonight. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, so there are some uh, takeaways from this meeting. Um, John and I have actually drafted some take takeaways, so let me, uh, these are just five or six bullet points, so essentially, 
uh, well, we, this is a big group, right? We took this uh, picture and it looks just absolutely wonderful. So many people attended and again, I thank all of you for attending, uh, attending this. And what happened to the key? What? Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I, I'm not projecting it. I'll just read it out, the key, uh, key takeaways. Number one, so this is, this is what uh, uh, you know, many of us got from this entire proceedings of this meeting, and this is what we believe are takeaways. You may have your own additional takeaways, but this is a sort of a minimal set. Uh, number one, capturing human diversity continues to be a challenge, but HCA Asia researchers are in the vanguard. So we do have a responsibility, we have made a commitment, we do have a responsibility to take this uh, forward. Uh, um, number two, HCA flagship projects have a strong potential to foster regional collaboration and connect single cell atlases to regional uh, priorities. So that's the second bullet point. We need to think about our regional priorities and we need to connect amongst ourselves and then connect globally as well. Third, single cell genomics research is advancing from being descriptive to hypothesis driven and we have seen that. Uh, many talks were descriptive, but there were quite a few talks that were kind of hypothesis-driven, much more focused than just being, uh, uh, being descriptive. Uh, number four, understanding and identifying factors that impact on robustness of inferences helps create better tools. So yesterday in many of the breakout sessions, this is what was discussed, that uh, the tools are being uh, developed and how do we know one tool is better than the other or more robust than the other. So one of the ways that uh, you know, uh, we have heard in the uh, breakout sessions is that identify those key factors that impact on robustness of inferences, and if you can identify those key factors, then we can improve on the existing tools. Uh, five, time series single cell data help us understand development of tissues and organs. Right now, uh, most, of the, most of the talks were you know, sort of single time point data. Uh, wouldn't actually t tell us about how cell types and cell states, uh, uh, you know, change over a period of time during development. Um, so uh, time series data, time course collection of uh, biospecimens would help us uh, understand that and that's very, very critical, especially in order to be able to manage uh, diseases. Uh, to be able to manage diseases, we need to understand, um, you know, health uh, and therefore over a period of time, time course analysis will help understand uh, you know, how health develops better, normal development happens, and then perturbations can be more easy to detect and manage. Um, so these are the key takeaways, and thank you very much. And essentially, I also would like to thank um, uh, Esther. Esther Tua was here. So she's actually uh, drafted all of this. And thank you, Esther. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yoshi. Uh, Yoshi also kept up you know, all night trying to make sure that the LED wall walk works and the IT. Thank you, Yoshi. And last but not the least, John is uh, really a support. He's the pillar. And uh, you know, we, we engage with him. He generates the money, talks to the people, talks to various funders, and so on, and guides us. So John is really a pillar, and we all thank him from the depth of our heart. John, thank you. Well, thank you all, and uh, please go to dinner. <laughs>